Good morning and welcome to Bravo TT Live and our YouTube channel. These have been made possible by the British Legion and the Drive Project. I'm Neris and got involved with Bravo TT, participant in the brilliant art and theatre workshops they run. Bravo TT Live is bringing amazing artists, sharing their insights with you across a huge range of creative skills, chatting with you live, straight to your homes. We'd love you to share Bravo TT Live with your military friends and family. Like and share us on Facebook, and even subscribe to our YouTube channel. During the session, please interact with us and ask any questions or put any questions on the live chat function. I'll try my best to get through them all. We have lots coming up over the next few weeks, both in art and theatre. This session is part of a new series on film coming to you each Tuesday. Today we have the super talented award-winning production designer Chris Roop. Chris, good morning. Hi Neris, how are you? I'm really good, it's raining Thanks. here. It is a bit here as well, I think the worst is over though. But thanks so much for having me on, I'm delighted to be here. Hello everyone, hi. Well, I'm a production designer and I've been working in the film and TV industry for about 30 years. And um, it's a very freelance industry, so I've never had a, a permanent job. They're all full time, but they're very limited contract. Um, well, I'm going to a proper job then. Well, I consider it a proper job, but you know, we work very hard, and then we have a bit of time off. So that's how it works for us. Um, I'm going to talk about design for screen, which is what I do. So it's for film and television, and it's not for stage, which is a very different discipline: musicals and theatre and the like. So, um, and then we'll have a look at a couple of projects I've worked on, which are some of the issues and the challenges that we come up against. Brilliant. So what exactly is production design? Well, broadly, I'd say it's the visualisation of when and where the story is set. And it documents what happens in the story. So are we in the past, the present or the future? Are we set here in the UK? Are we in a fantasy land? Are we in a rainforest in Africa? Are we in a spaceship? Are we on another planet? It can be any of these things. And once the world is established, the designer looks to explain how the character sits and, how, and then can elaborate on that character's story. So for instance, if we're doing a show that's in contemporary London, um, does the character live in a house or a flat? Uh, will we see the character's office? Do we know what type of car the, the person drives? Maybe we see the their parents house and would then compare that with their house and then you start to build up a picture of the character and help ensure that the audience can enter the world of the story but also there's one that you might not necessarily have thought of, and that's that design can help the audience ask how they feel about a character and what they're feeling about the story and I look upon this as the emotional temperature of the show so are we looking to portray a realistic setting? And are we gonna play things straight? Or can we push realism by concentrating on certain colors or textures? And if it's a sad story or situation, is the look somber? Is that what you do? Or if it's comedy, is it bright and happy? So these are all things that can make people think in a certain way. And they all help to create a visual mood. And one way of looking at it is that design can be thought as the equivalent of the soundtrack, and it can help the audience appreciate the character's situation. Um, the starting point for the design is always the script, because obviously it tells you where the character lives, um, might outline the basic decor and suggest the details inside, family photos, that sort of thing. Is the flat tidy? Is it untidy? Is it somewhere the audience actually might like to live? Um, or is the, is the look of it designed to make you know, perhaps take pity on the character? It can be all of these. It crucially also tells you what's needed in a scene. If you need a television, uh, if you need a sink that actually works. And so the this, this scene will outline the choreography, which room leads to another and how characters move through them. But crucially also the director tells you how he or she would like to shoot the scene, where the actors might go and how the cameras might move. So therefore you get an idea of how the, how the space, uh, what sort of space is needed. That also helps like whether you're going to film on a location or perhaps you build a set. So if you film on a location, there's the whole process of clearing it, of uh, painting it and constructing it and dressing it and film striking it. But if you can't film in a real location, what do you do perhaps due to its size? Maybe it's too small. Actually, two or three years ago, I worked on a, 
a series where two characters actually have sex in a cupboard um, next to a chapel under the House of Commons. Actually, the cupboard does exist in real life. But um, Neris, how would you get two actors, a camera, a director perhaps, certainly the cameraman, microphone and lights in a cupboard? Well, clearly we'd be really, really close, wouldn't we? I think you would. I think, honestly, it wouldn't sit. It just simply wouldn't fit. So you build a set. So the idea of building a set like that, which wouldn't really be much bigger than the real cupboard, is that you can remove a wall. So you take one wall away, and that's called floating. You float a wall. So you float a wall away. You film from that side. You film the whole scene, probably, maybe a close-up. And then you put the wall back, take the camera around the other side, take off the other wall and film the scene from there. And this generally is the advantage of filming in a studio. It gives control over space that you wish to use, the lighting and the sound. And actually, one interesting thing, actually, is that in a particular scene or sequence, or perhaps a whole country house, for instance, you would combine different sets and different locations to make up one story location. That's often what happens. So That sounds the, like quite a hard thing to do um, for the job, deciding what you should create and what you should do in its actual location. Well, I think, generally speaking, obviously it's, if you can, if the location is really what you want, and generally, you know, in a lot of places you do things to locations. Maybe if you go to a country house, what you're allowed to do, or, or National Trust property, there's a lot of filming done in National House, National Trust properties for period films. And you know, be, it, it's a big organisation thing, and you, you're allowed to change certain things, some things you're not. So generally, you know, if, you, if there's a location that works and it's not the wrong end of the country, then often it's best to film in them because you get so much of, of reality that you don't have to um, create yourself. However, sometimes you really want to create it yourself because it gives you what you want. And of course, building a set can be a bit more expensive. So it, many, many things come back to resource, in other words, the budget. So it's not just about having lovely ideas. So much of the job is about how you're going to realize them. It's a succession of deadlines, the job. And you spend money on construction and decoration and you spend money on people to make all these things happen. And, and the job really is the balancing of all these things. Um, somewhat, you know, people's first job. I don't think so, but I suppose I've been doing it quite a while. So it, but it's certainly exhilarating and interesting and you get to meet extraordinary people. The research is really interesting. And you go, you know, you also go to interesting locations. I don't know. I mean, I've chatted with you and I've heard about some of locations that you've had to film on and that you've yeah. uh, that done your production design in Africa and all over the place. Sounds pretty exciting to me. Well, it, it, I mean, it really can be. I would say, you know, a lot of the most extraordinary experiences of my life have been at work. Um, you know, none more so doing War and Peace, the BBC series that was out uh, two or three years ago, which, you know, was set in Napoleonic Wars in Russia in the early 19th century. And we filmed that in, in Lithuania. Um, when you're finding, um, uh, you know, or you say you're filming in uh, Lithuania, yeah. with that, uh, we've got a question from Molly, which is, do you rely on a location manager or do you find these locations like Lithuania for yourself? No, Sally, you're spot on. That's absolutely right. There is a location manager you, and, and that location manager would have their assistant. So they go around looking for the locations, they take photos, they take films, they've obviously done their research. And before that, we would discuss the script and decide what sort of place we want. They go looking for them. They bring us back photographs um, and the director and the designer. And, or, you know, the producer will be involved and, and later on the cameraman. Um, and, and, you know, and we choose. And then the location department looks after those locations on behalf of the owners whilst we go along and film. Okay. So, so really, it sounds like it's a huge amount of teamwork. It is. Um, and it's all about it's all about teamwork an important thing there's far too much work for I, I i personally think far too many ideas for one person to have and i would always like to create an atmosphere where my team will you know any ideas as they can as well and you know i'm not proud about whose ideas i mean obviously i'm sort of pulling the tiller and, and sifting through and talking to the director but it is very very much a team absolutely yeah we're in lithuania and yes. you're going to tell us about war and peace i am indeed um well, an interesting thing about it's a big book, as, as probably most people know. It's a beautiful book, actually. I did read it. I did read it when I knew I was doing the job, and it's such a light book, and it's got so, so much great information in it and clues for the design. It was really good. Um, and 
we were based in Lithuania, we filmed there and we filmed a little bit in Latvia and in St. Petersburg itself, where some of it's set. But the idea of that, so this is a period drama with four aristocratic families and their loves and lives and their, you know, how they get involved in the war. So what are the main threads of the design? I, you know, what, what are we trying to tell the audience? We want to tell them where they are historically and, and put the story within this background. But um, we, and we need to show through the houses where they live and through the courts that they go to and the balls that they go to, where they stand in society. So, you know, it seemed that we had to grind this in, ground it in reality. And we use, you know, real location. However, there were four main families, each of whom had up to three houses each. And, um, you know, so on, on screen, it can be quite complicated for the audience to know where they are. So it's very important differentiate between these different houses and tell the audience quickly so in terms of issues we I would say for the peace part of the show as opposed to the war we discovered there simply were not enough locations to film in to tell the whole story and our budget was not set up to build lots in the studio so hence we're back to the ideas you know the constraints of your resources but we worked out I thought that if we could build one composite set and a composite set is one where rooms lead into the other and if the schedule, the filming schedule allowed us to do it, we would, we would film in it four times, redecorating it uh, and um, re, refurnishing it three times. I so there's a question there, Chris, yes. um, which Lorraine's asked, and that is that obviously you're on a budget. What happens if you go over? That's a very good question. I don't actually know because I think I can have <laughs> say I've never gone over. I think maybe oh, I did once in America, but I think I was back by the time everyone realized <laughs> Run away. There, were, there, were, there were construction issues and there, there were they they did understand it why so i generally speaking I, I consider the budget you know in a way my responsibility to the production to the budget and to everyone i'm working with you know on equal footing with the design as well of course you know not within the industry and the people that know you might be remembered as a budget lower if that's what you do but generally you're going to be really remembered for you know what you've done visually and and you know you could say that's the most important but you simply have to remember what you're doing with the budget so you created this set so that you yeah. could use it several times over to be different people's um, houses yes. so um how did that work can you show us well yes indeed first the first house which was the Bolkonski uh, house out in the country we we painted it quite light so that would be sort of much area um, and we built it so that we could move minimal construction changes help, um, help each time you see it, help make it look different. So we, we pre-built the set so you could move the doors easily. So the next set, which was the Rostov house in Moscow, I wanted to give it a sort of tobacco-y older feel and, and make it sort of more, more rooted in the past. Um, and then the third one, it was another family house, Konsky house in Moscow, we actually used fabric on the wall, we found we could spray on with glue. In reality, they were generally stitched on the framework, but that worked very nicely. Of course, it's only got to good for a week or so, and then yeah. if it all falls down, all, all sort of peels off, it doesn't matter. So the third time was with this dark golden fabric, and that was a that was where at the very, you know, the, a lot of the story climax is there, and it's, it worked really well with candles, and uh, you see a lot of candles in periods. So generally, when you're thinking of these things, you're also thinking what is, think of a think of a period portrait, you know, a master, a grand master portrait, you know, how does that feel that, you know, so you want to, you want to feel about how a tight shot on some face is going to look and what you'll see in the background. So often you're designing and posing for that sort of setting. So, Chris, when you're designing all of these sets and coming up with all these ideas, Ian's asked a question that is, do you have a regular team that you work with? Ian, I do, yes, and some of them now are some of my closest friends. Uh -huh. um, I, the art director, who um, who's my right hand man, as it were, um, I've been working with for nearly twenty years, um, and then li likewise the set decorator. So the art director is is effectively in charge of the construction side of things, and the set decorator is in charge of dressing the sets, putting all the furnishings and props in set, and choosing those. And those are the two I've worked with most. I've a wonderful construction manager who I've worked with for a few years. But of course, they can't always come with me when I go abroad. You know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So if I'm abroad, like I was in Lithuania, uh, I took one person from the UK and everyone else 
was local. Uh, great. So uh, we've done the peace section. Yeah. What happened to set up war? Well, war was quite a big number. Um, the biggest set piece, I would say, was the Battle of Borodino, which in real life had nigh on 200,000 combatants in it. We had at most 200. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of visual trickery, a lot of which is done with visual effects, um, which can provide explosions and smoke, additional smoke, and then basically make a wide shot look like it's a full full blown battle with you know thousands of troops marching so in order to preserve resources for this i wanted to make our main set piece within that battle which was the grand redoubt on the russian side which was their main artillery uh, bastion i wanted to make that work so it could film entirely in camera that is with minimal post-production work minimal visual effects and i felt that that a kidney bean shape would work best so that the artillery we, we we decided we could afford to make from scratch six guns. The artillery could be in a slight curve and the suggestion would be off either end, there are more guns and more people happening. So we um, hired a digger, basically a JCB. And we went, uh, we were in the countryside about half an hour outside Vilnius, uh, which is the capital of Lithuania. And Henry, my art director was down there showing him where to dig. So there they, you can see the, the, the digger doing its work there and with it are uh, all these gabions which, are, which were wicker baskets which are effectively period handbags that was from the, you know okay. I, I would say at the, towards the end of the 19th century they're using sandbags and gabions are disappearing but of course so they were designed for all the, the spoil all the earth to go um, and that would provide protection against shot musket shot and up to solid shot from cannon um, so you can see that, in the, you, you will have seen that, and you can see that in the second picture, you can see the guns that we need, and, and this, is the, this is the dress before the filming starts. Uh, there is, if you, what I decided to do was leave two or three of the gabions empty without, um, without Earth, so why do you suppose that? Well, it sounds like you move things around on set and they sound really heavy. That's exactly right, exactly. So it's, it's equivalent of floating the walls. So what we had to do, we had to put black material inside these gabions so that the light wouldn't shoot through them, so they still look full. It had a piece of wood on the top with just a little bit of earth piled on it, but we could pull them away, give the camera a different position nearest the main gun that we were using. And also, if you do that, you're also suggesting to the director and the cameraman where you think the best angle on the set is. So hopefully they film it in the way that, you know, you want them to film it. And we've got a we've got a little extract of, um, of 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 one of the scenes in the story. Be brilliant to see it. Yeah. All right, I won't get in the way. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Oh, So you would have seen Pierre, who's one of the main characters who lives in um, one of the houses earlier. His character just wanted basically to see what war is like. He's a Russian nobleman and he, he goes to the battle and asks to be put in the thick of it and see if there's anything he can do to help. So, as I said, the you know, experience and ideas come from the book, from the novel itself. And I also got a lot of ideas from paintings. And actually, one of the first books I bought myself when I was 10 or 11, I was very interested in military history and still am. So War and Peace was a good job for me. So basically, you look for contemporary illustrations and um, I just to help you make things correct. So those are almost like your other inspirations to bring. So you're the script your first inspiration the first thing you go to and then yeah. you use all these other things added to it to inspire you more to get the feel for it yeah exactly that exactly that and then of course you know you also think what might work from you know just from your pure imagination so i always find it's good to ground yourself in reality and then and then go off from there which actually is rather what happened in another project i worked on which was a film called thunderpants which was made about 20 years ago. It was a children's family film. 
very different to War and Peace because it was about a boy who had completely uncontrollable flatulence and he's bullied at school. It turns out actually he has two cows. I, I beg your pardon, he has two stomachs like a cow. But ultimately he uses this issue to do good um, and he makes friends because he, it turns out that he can use his emissions to power a rescue rocket that goes up to uh, rescue a stranded space station. So obviously this is not quite a normal everyday story. Um, so we, the director Pete and I talked about how we would make it look and we decided it needed an element of it. And actually when he sent me the script, he also just said, um, it's going to be green, by the way, Chris. So I took, I thought about that, and then I thought about comics and how how they're printed, and how they just have two colours. So we decided everything green would be good. Talking of green, yes, uh, we've got a great question in from Matt, and that is, how much green screen and CGI um, do you now use over traditional uh, production design? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think it varies from project to project. Personally, in the last show I did, we've had quite a lot um, because uh, we had we, we filmed in a house in Scotland where a whole wing was meant to have burned down. So actually what we did was the, the grip department, the, the scaffold has built an enormous green screen off one side of the building, um, which is behind a low single story building. And then later on in post-production, that is all put in. So right. I think it varies. It does vary. And then if you want effects above it, you, know, you often use greens in front of which you put effects, but it very, very much varies. Great. Thank you. Great. So thunder pants. So yes. We're in this green world. Oh, indeed. And not a green screen world. There was not very much <laughs> green screen. That was 20 years ago. And there was a little bit, um, not a huge amount. Um, but you'll see um, what we did. We literally decided to paint everything in the world immediate world green so his living his his kitchen you can see him coming up shortly um and the idea was just to make it very simple very broad strokes that you know it's not full of smalls and decoration and we just, just get very very simple following the idea of green and one other color either the wood color or a cream color to go with it so just very simplistic and rather comic book in its in its feel and we also did the same for the outdoors we filmed in a little um, estate um, in Hammersmith and we got everyone to not walk outside when we were filming. We asked them to move <laughs> cars. We painted some mini green and parked them and we painted everybody's front screen and painted them back off. Um, actually, I live quite near that place now and I've noticed that the council have put in new doors and strangely enough, they're all green. <laughs> right. Brilliant. Um, so then um, as the story, earlier that he goes into space and rests the rocket but we, we then had to come up with our idea of our version of NASA and we decided there just literally to paint everything white and we, we use um, mission photos from the Apollo 11 mission that we we got and just played it very very straight um, so one way of communicating ideas to, to my department and to the director and other departments is we draw visual so it's a sketch of what we might want the set to look up um, and there's one here which was based very much on the astronaut suit up room where they where they put on their spacesuits just before they go up. Um, and we used it for Patrick, who's the character, the farting character, to do a test burn, um, you know, to fire up a little, it's like a sort of massive Bunsen burner clamped to the backside of his space. And on location, we can see what um, what this, what the location looked like and how it matched that drawing. And this was filmed in a in an empty office in, in Hertfordshire. It's the old electricity generating board, and it was a big knockdown. So it was great. We could pretty much do what we wanted. But generally speaking, on a film like that, and most things, is to have an idea, have a basic idea, and 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 follow it through really strongly. So it's quite obvious what you're doing. Thank you, Chris. Um, both those sound like they're amazing projects to work on. But uh, we've had a few questions in about the challenges. Yeah. So um, David's asked, what's your, been your biggest challenge professionally to date? I would say, well, peace was a significant challenge um, and um, it, it, it was such a big logistical number. So I would I would say that um, and, you know, for the reasons explained earlier, just the amount of work there was to do and needing to get it right and, and, and have a big department. And also, I suppose, in a way, it was a personal challenge because I was doing a big 
a big number with very few people I worked with. In fact, thinking about it, there was no one in my department I'd worked with before. So that was a bit, of, you know, it, it worked out beautifully and they were fantastic people, but it, in that respect, it was a bit of a challenge. Um, so uh, you say that obviously you've got these challenges to deal with. Um, how, how do you deal with that? What does your team do? Do you have lots of people behind you? Yes, I do indeed. As I, as I was saying, the, um, you have the team splits into very much the art direction side and the set decoration side, and they head their own um, parts of the unit, of, of the department. In a way, I have thought of the past as the, as the design as sort of the admiral of the fleet and the art director and the set decorators are the captains of the ship or the, something like that. So that's really how it works out, but it is very much a collaborative effort. And um, we've got some really great questions. In. So Sally's asked, um, how do you get involved in production design? That is a good question. And um, Sally, I, it's a funny one because I have no qualifications or for, for design work specifically. I have an art O level and I have a Blue Peter competition winner's badge from the early 70s. And that's as far as it goes. They're sought after those badges, sought Indeed. after. And mine is, you know, the Val Singleton day. So, you know, and John Noakes and Purvis and also a particularly good one. Um, so, and I did a degree, but I'd always done theatre at school and at university you know did the decor and did the set design and always really enjoyed it and wasn't sure what I was going to do after a degree and thought well oh, maybe people do theatre you know people obviously have to do theatre because someone does it I didn't want to do that because they, it required more more education but I realized I could start as a runner um, so completely unqualified I, I had a friend who worked for a company um, that did pop promos and music video and commercials. So I did a few tiny jobs for her and then pestered people that I'd, I'd ring up designers and then eventually more work. Of course, now that it's, a, you know, the industry is different. It's not so centered around people working in the house at televisions or working in a studio. And there are many more the film design degrees. There are very, very good universities. Nottingham Trent is particularly good and Bournemouth and Kingston are, but those are, you know, those are degree courses. You know, so it's put into it from both the bottom up or nowadays doing a degree and obviously finding a job or a degree. Absolutely. But interestingly, I wouldn't necessarily choose someone with a degree over someone who doesn't have a degree. You know, it's so much of the job is about who you are and what you're like with people. Obviously, you know, you're going to need some a degree of talent, but a lot of it is about application and just being able to see stuff through and being, you know, you spend a lot of time with people of, you know, hours and hours, you know, your, your week can be incredibly long, you can be completely full time, especially if you go abroad, I guess it's a bit like going on military deployment, you're basically spending, you know, most of your waking hours with your colleagues, so it becomes a very important thing. Now, we've got lots of questions in, yeah. so we're not going to be able to cover them all, no. um, but uh, some important things I suppose for you is um, that, uh, Sally asked, have you ever been refused a location that you've like set your heart on or? Yes. <laughs> Sally, it does happen, and it also it particularly happened in here. I'm going back to War and Peace, but it happened in the in a, a beautiful palace in St Petersburg, um, the Menshikov Palace, and we were really keen to use it. But it was part of the Hermitage, uh, the old um, Winter Palace, and I did a sort of half an hour plea to a representative why they should really let us use it, but they said no. Oh, such a shame. Yeah. Melissa, it's been amazing to chat with you guys today. And we have had some other questions in, um, but lots of them, I think they can uh, have a look on Google and find out the answers. Right. Um, so um, thank you everybody for tuning in today and asking brilliant questions. We, and we'd love to see your comments along the way as well. In the video description below, there are some great resources to help you find more artistic opportunities. There's also a feedback form, which is really important to us because we'd love you to fill in to make Bravo 22 Live bigger and better each week. We'll be back this Thursday on Bravo 22 Live, bringing you a sculpture demo. Now, this is being presented by our amazing Sally Ann and run by Jim Jack. Guys, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I hope the weather gets better with you wherever you are and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.